What if I told you that you could take a piece of DNA, use the scissors, cut it into fragments and insert DNA from another organism to make a genetically modified DNA? What am I talking about? Is this even possible? Doesn't it sound something out of Jurassic Park maybe? But what I am talking about is possible and has been possible for quite some time now. These scissors aka molecular scissors are what are used to cut the DNA into fragments. Why are these molecular scissors? It makes sense, right? Because all of this is happening at a molecular level. You cannot see the DNA with your naked eye and you cannot see the DNA fragments either with your naked eye. So these molecular scissors work by breaking the hydrogen bonds and the phosphodiester bonds holding the piece of DNA together into different fragments. So what are these molecular scissors? They are restriction endonucleases or restriction enzymes. So an endonuclease is an nuclease enzyme that can cut DNA inside a sequence. Whereas an exonuclease, EXO, exonuclease is something that can cut only at the ends of a DNA sequence. Nucleases are a category of enzymes that can cut or digest nucleic acid sequences, which is why these restriction enzymes are also called restriction endonucleases. Now, what are these restriction enzymes and how do they work? So first off, restriction enzymes, basically they're enzymes, right? So they have specific active sites and these active sites recognize something known as restriction sites on the target DNA. Say you have a piece of target DNA. How do these restriction enzymes know where to go and bind and where to cut? They go and identify restriction sites. And what are these restriction sites? Restriction sites are specific palindromic sequences in that target DNA. You may be familiar with the term palindrome, but if not, what exactly is a palindrome? A palindrome is a word that is spelled the same both ways, front and back. So a race car is an example of a palindrome, R-A-C-E-C-A-R, R-A-C-E-C-A-R. So like this, restriction enzymes recognize specific restriction sites, which are palindromic short 5 to 8 nucleotide long sequences. So these are some examples of restriction sites that a few restriction enzymes can recognize. And they make cuts within this restriction site. For example, if you take this restriction site, 5 prime to 3 prime G A A T T C. If you take a look at this direction, 5 prime to 3 prime G A A T T C. So this is a palindromic restriction site. And this restriction enzyme cuts here and here giving these sort of hanging pieces. They are also known as overhangs. We'll talk more about that later. So this is how restriction enzymes work. They recognize these restriction sites. They bind somewhere at the site or sometimes even near this site and they cut at specific regions in this restriction site. Now you may be wondering, are these found naturally or are they something that are produced artificially in a laboratory? Well, restriction enzymes are found naturally in a lot of prokaryotes like bacteria and archaea as a defense mechanism. What do they defend themselves against? Basically, any pathogen that can affect bacteria or archaea like viruses, these prokaryotes use the restriction enzymes as a defense mechanism against those viruses. When scientists discovered the existence of such restriction enzymes in prokaryotes, they thought that it can be used for other purposes as well if they could be extracted and they went about extracting these restriction enzymes and they began to use it extensively in the field of genetic engineering. So where are they used in the field of genetic engineering? What are they used for? They have a variety of uses in genetic engineering. A specific example is the creation of recombinant DNA. What is recombinant DNA? It is when a foreign DNA is inserted into the DNA of another organism, basically copy pasting DNA from one organism to another. So what happens in this case is they take a cloning vector. We'll learn more about this when we talk about gene cloning. But for now, understand that a cloning vector is like a plasmid of a bacterium, extra chromosomal DNA of that bacterium. They take a piece of a cloning vector and then they also take the foreign DNA which contains an important gene like say the gene that codes for insulin. So what they do is that they treat both the cloning vector and this foreign DNA with the same restriction enzymes. So the same restriction enzymes will cut at the same restriction sites. This is very important to make sure that these two pieces fuse together, that these two pieces bind together. So if there is complementary base pairs overhangs that are present in both the cloning vector and the foreign DNA, it makes the integration of foreign DNA into the cloning vector much easier. So the restriction enzymes are going to cut here 
at specific sites where this restriction site is present and the foreign DNA is going to be inserted here with the help of DNA ligase of course. So this is how they form the recombinant DNA. So now this becomes a recombinant DNA which is a plasmid. So they're going to insert this plasmid inside a bacterium say like E. coli mm -hmm. and this E. coli, this host cell now becomes a transformed host cell or a genetically modified organism because it has its DNA modified with bits and pieces of other foreign DNA. And when this bacterium, when this E. coli is going to divide, when it is going to produce proteins, it's going to produce the foreign proteins as well. Now that we've learnt about an example of where restriction enzymes are used, let's talk about some examples of restriction enzymes itself. So there are several restriction enzymes that have been identified so far and they have a specific type of nomenclature or the way they have been named. For example, ECO-R1 is a type of a restriction enzyme. So what does this ECO stands for? E stands for Escherichia, the genus name of this source organism. CO stands for the first two letters of the species name of the source organism. R here stands for the strain of the source organism from which the enzyme was extracted. And 1 is the sequence of the enzyme that has been extracted. So, ECO R1 is the first enzyme that was extracted from the R strain of Escherichia coli. For example, this HAE3 here, this restriction enzyme, H stands for Haemophilus, AE stands for Egyptius, and 3 means this is the third restriction enzyme that has been extracted from this source organism. Now let's take a look at some of the restriction sites of these restriction enzymes. So we already are familiar with this sequence GAATTC, right? This belongs to the restriction enzyme ECO-R1. And this is going to make a cut right here between G and A on both strands of DNA, giving something known as a sticky end. Why is it a sticky end? Because of the presence of this overhang right here. It's not evenly cut. This strand has only one nucleotide, while this strand has five nucleotides. So this is not even, right? That's why it's known as a sticky end or an overhang. In contrast, if you take a look at the cut made by HAE3, you see it cuts right in the middle here. There is no overhang or extended sequence of DNA. Such a cut made by restriction enzyme is known as a blunt end. Blunt because there is no overhang. Scientists usually prefer using enzymes that give sticky ends compared to blunt ends because if there is a sticky end, then it means that the two complementary sequences can bind more easily with the help of ligase when compared to a blunt end. That's why they prefer using enzymes like ECO R1 or TAC1 or even HIND3. So this is about restriction enzymes. We'll talk more about restriction enzymes when we talk about gene cloning and other principles of biotechnology.